Hello, my name is Eric Davis, Executive Director of TV Santa Barbara, and you are in for a treat tonight, uh, today, as we film the Santa Barbara Forum, produced by Michael Nicholson. Our guest today is Ira Opper, pioneer of community access television in Santa Barbara back in 1974. Today we're just going to tell a story and look back at the journey of TV Santa Barbara and its roots in this community. Uh, Ira, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so we are coming off of um, an incredible event where we celebrated 45 years of community access television, and that's the reason you are here. We had a, a real nice award ceremony and, and gala at the Alcazar Theater in um, Carpinteria, and it looks like you were the hit of the night. And people <laughs> really interested in this origin story, as was I. Um, so um, let's just kind of, kind of, get into it a little bit. And um, what'd you think of the other night, uh, Saturday night? Uh, well, one, it was amazing to meet everybody. I really had a really good time. Uh, people seemed to be engaged and entertained. And then uh, to watch all the people, uh, producers and directors and talent that work with you and how excited they were for you know, receiving the recognition. It was, it was a very uh, uh, exciting and interesting and uh, enjoyable event for me. Good. Well, and thank you for being there as our keynote for that event. And thank you for being here today on your uh, stay here in Santa Barbara. Um, yes, they were, they, uh, here's how Jerry Roberts described it, our journalism award winner. The founder of the evening's highlight, however, was a presentation by pioneering television producer Ira Opper, who co-founded the station in 1975 and led the audience on a hilarious excursion through the early, its early days illustrated with a series of black and white photos and short segments of primeval video. So um, I think that's what it was. You had people in stitches. It was, it was a fun retrospective. You know, it's kind of an interesting history uh, because it was, it, it, was, it was born out of passion and um, what we wanted to do is, is tell fun stories and, and you know, we, uh, we spent a lot of time on the serious side of things, mm -hmm. politically and socially, that was going on in the 70s in, in Santa Barbara. But on the other side of it, we did have a sense of humor about the whole thing. That's what I really got out of it for myself uh, as executive director. The opportunity to have more fun, you know, to, to really to uh, laugh at yourself, to get in the community. Uh, there are some great clips. <laughs> you were asking people on the street if they had heard of Channel 2 or uh, what you were doing. <laughs> and they would say no or yes, and then you'd press them on the yes, and they couldn't <laughs> name it. I was just, uh, were, th were those just man on the street segments that you were doing? Well, in the very beginning, um, we didn't have any shows, you know, until we started to engage the community. And we started off, and I just took my crew, I had a small crew, and we went out on the streets and, and started to introduce community TV and access and utilizing the interviews on the streets and then interviews with the politicians and uh, as a way to sort of start, kind of kickstart it. And it worked. I mean, was, you know, people recognized uh, they could have uh, an opportunity to produce programming uh, aired locally. You know, it was only 12 channels back then. So you paid 585 for your cable service. Mm -hmm. It was called Santa Barbara Cable TV. And you got 12 channels. And um, when Channel 2, which was CBS out of LA, and Channel 12 out of uh, Santa Maria, KCOY, um, when they were duplicated, we could take off uh, CBS uh, LA. We had to protect CBS out of uh, Santa Maria as a local station and run whatever we want from 8 to 11. So that's how it started. So the early 70s were quite a time here in Santa Barbara. You know, we had, we had the oil spill in the 69, uh, UCSB, the riots there. What was the climate uh, in the early 70s? Well, UCSB was in turmoil uh, because of the rioting and uh, the war. And Nixon was president. Uh, you know, politically and socially, we were going through a revolution as well. 69, the oil spill, uh, that was tragic, uh, but it's, 
you know, these things, the unintended consequences. There was a, you know, an environmental movement, mm -hmm. you know, that came of it. Politically, uh, things changed as well. We, you know, we ended up with a, a forum, platform, uh, to talk to the community. You know, there was only KC, or KEYT was the only station if you didn't have cable. So you had to watch the news at six mm -hmm. and 11, and that's it. You got 30 minutes. You didn't get the opportunity. They didn't produce much local programming here. So you didn't get an opportunity to kind of get engaged with the issues or even the entertainment and talent. Uh, you know, they, they didn't have a, again, they didn't have a, a place to show their, their talents. So. so what was your itch to get started? <laughs> well, we started InnoVision, uh, Charlie Bensinger and I. It was the first production company, uh, independent production company in Santa Barbara. It, you know, we're, we're going through a technical revolution uh, as well, uh, as politically and socially. And uh, Sony introduced the portable video system, the first, you know, low cost system. Prior to that, you either had to shoot film uh, or you had to be in a TV studio. So this was the uh, first opportunity that, you know, take the, hand, they take the equipment out of the hands of, of just the television stations and give it to people that can do other things. And video being uh, a, a brand new medium at the time uh, allowed you to edit things quicker, uh, put things together, show them through a TV instead of a projector in a dark room with a screen. So uh, our company sold video equipment, uh, Sony video equipment. We sold videotape uh, as a way to pay for the equipment that we had, that we plugged together because our real passion was production. Uh, we did some local things, uh, but we didn't have a, a forum to play it. And then uh, we had classes. We taught, we came up with this video lab, which was courses. And then we got accredited through UCSB. And uh, that was kind of the foundation of how to train people to use video equipment. Because Santa Barbara back then was a film town. You had That's Brooks. Right. Yes. Brooks taught film. Mm -hmm. uh, photography. There was a photographer on every corner. This place was lousy with photographers. Everybody was a photographer once upon a time, which was kind of interesting, you know, because ki students would be on the streets and they'd be shooting different types of equipment. Uh, but there was, n we were the only video in, in town. So, uh, you know, we, it was kind of, uh, well, how do we get on t cable TV? And what, how do we open this up to the new medium and the new opportunities? And uh, Charlie, my partner, uh, was a very prolific writer and um, we wrote a few grants, got some funding. Uh, we did some special education work out of US USC. Again, the implementation of video is kind of an innovative tool. And then uh, the, big, the big one was uh, we ended up with the California Council on Criminal Justice uh, Police Training Videos for the state of California. Historically, what they did was they had to, every day, they would play a, a film during roll call for the police departments. And, uh, you know, they had to roll out the projector, thread it up, darken the room. And uh, the grant was to see how video would work in that application. Hmm. So we were fortunate enough to get that grant. So we did about 25 uh, police training videos that kind of looked like the TV show Cops. And uh, we did a few for the FBI. Uh, during that whole grant period. And then, yeah, we got, okay, we're done with the cops. Let's do something else. So. And this is still InnoVision at the time. It was still InnoVision, yeah. It was, uh, what happened was, is that we, we used that opportunity to buy equipment and build our production capability. And then uh, what our passion and our heart and, and, and our drive was to um, do environmental type product and programs. And uh, we teamed up as I recall, with the Ecology Center, with Hal Conklin mm -hmm. and Paul Rellis. I think they were both running it. And they had invited Ralph Nader to UCSB to speak with the Raiders. Uh, at, at that point, way before his political career, he was a consumer advocate. He was very well known for uh, getting legislation and lobbying for the consumer and for the people. And at that time, they were building, rapidly building uh, nuclear power plants all over the country. Mm -hmm. And he was speaking about the dangers 
fission and plutonium. I mean, all these you know cancer-causing uh, aspects of it. And uh, uh, so we videotaped him uh, at the at the university. Uh, we used a UCSB extension class to crew, edit it together, kind of crudely, and um, went, "Hey, let's take this over to uh, Santa Barbara Cable TV and." Uh, and get them there, you know. And the FCC had mandated That's right. um, That's right. in '74 mm -hmm. uh, public, government, and educational act free access to the local cable. Cable franchises were licensed; they were contracted to the city, regulated by the federal government. But the city had control over the cable service, so it was kind of a different. wasn't a, really a utility per se, but uh, so uh, we. Shot this video with Ralph and, and Nader and, the, and his team and, uh, and the Ecology Center and, and postered, we, well, we went over to uh, Cox or Santa Barbara Cable TV as we knew it and it was just, everybody there, all they cared about was hooking people up to this re basically a retransmission service so they can watch TV. And they didn't want anything to do with us, you could tell, you know, we were just, you know, we were a little different than they were. <laughs> they were very <laughs> technical engineers and we were kind of on the other side of that, yeah, uh, kind of a art movement. And uh, they were resistant and then we finally, they finally said, look, if you pay us, we'll put your show on. So we went back to UCSB, uh, got them to cut a check, uh, which was kind of one of the smart things that we did because we had, we had a physical check and we paid them 50 bucks to run it, and they guaranteed us an airtime and everything else. We went over there. They didn't even have enough equipment. We had to bring our own equipment over, plug it in, tested everything, and um, postered Isla Vista like you would a surf movie, <laughs> uh, Santa Barbara. Got some write-ups in the underground paper. I think it was called the News and Review. And, uh, and we were really excited about it. You know, we're all all hanging out, just wow, we got, we're all gonna be on TV, you know, with our own thing. And uh, uh, they just, when it aired, it looked like, it looked terrible. Uh, it was, we felt we were sabotaged, it looked so bad. And they ran it late, and uh, the picture barely held up. And you could hear the sound, <laughs> and we were furious. And this video still exists, in fact. Uh, did you play a little bit of it the other night? Uh, yeah, we played yeah. a clip. It's on YouTube, it, it, if, you, if you look, uh, Nader, uh, I think it's Nader talks the future of nuclear power. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't live. So you packaged the piece, you brought it to, and you paid to run it on. We uh, paid. The university helped us pay. Uh, and then what happened was, you know, we were pretty bummed afterwards because it looked like crap. And we were Innovision. We had two studios in the um, El Presidio back then. We and and. and uh, really? Wow. Yeah, we had two uh, units, and we had one for production and one for offices and equipment. And we'd, you know, have breakfast in the El Paseo, and we ran into, shortly after that, we, Charlie and I ran into um, Leo Martinez, who was on sure. the council. Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me of Oscar, kind of young and, you know, ambitious. And um, he had just won a state Supreme Court ruling that you didn't have to, I think it was, you didn't have to live in Santa Barbara four years to run for office. I think he only lived there a year. And he ended up getting elected. And he was a really cool, open, progressive thinking guy. And we told him what our problem was and, and what happened. And, you know, we uh, actually recited what the FCC mandate because we were like, that's, isn't that the law, the, you know, for mm -hmm. this? And, uh, he uh, said, well, what you want to do is you want to come and make a presentation at, at city council. At, uh, I think it was public comment or something. I don't even call exactly, but I don't, I don't think it was an agenda item, but we just went in there and with our hearts pounding through our chest to city hall for the first time, speaking in front of you know, government officials and uh, told them our story, what happened. And they went back, I guess they reviewed it and went through that process and uh, all I remember is reading in the paper after a council meeting that they were putting Co uh, Santa Barbara Cable TV. This is when we learned it was Cox. We didn't know who they were at that time, which was a big communication conglomerate out of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, their franchise is going to be up for review and potential termination for violating federal communi communication acts 
and also for other things that you know people were complaining about, like customer service and things like that. So it was, it was all building up. Wow. And they weren't responsive. To the, they weren't being responsive to the community. So uh, we were like, cool. We're going to end up with the cable TV company. <laughs> <laughs> we were pretty ambitious. And um, what happened was, is Cox sent out the suits from Atlanta, find out who the rabble rousers were. <laughs> And they sent out, it, it was, you know, and we wouldn't talk to them. We, we, we yeah, we're, you guys are done. You know, we, we, we had a bit of an attitude about the whole thing. And they sent this young guy out from uh, San Diego. San Diego, Cox San Diego, was the number one largest cable market. Santa Barbara was the 10th at the time. Santa Barbara was completely wired, and I think 70 or 80 percent of the community had cable. San Diego was the largest and it was massive and they had a lot of, they had a big budget, way, way, it was like their marquee West Coast production facility. So they were very into community government, educational access, studio, mm -hmm. production vans, crews, the whole thing. And they sent this young guy up, you know, our age, in the 20s, and uh, he came, uh, he, call, he came by my office, we went, I was busy, you know, I didn't want to see him. He called a couple of times, and I picked up the phone like the second time, and he, John Long, who uh, is still a dear friend, um, called me and said, hey, you know, we want to take you out to dinner, you know, what can we do? We want to talk to you guys. Uh, and I was, okay, you know, as long as we can go to the chart house. <laughs> <laughs> So we went to the chart house and, uh, you know, on, on, on Cox's ticket, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> which when you were a starving videographer, you know, it's like, wow, can I get the surf and turf? <laughs> so uh, we sat and we talked and, and, you know, we had a vision, you know, mm -hmm. mobile production van. We want a studio, crew, sure. mm -hmm. equipment clean up the playback, let's get this figured out, you know, that was our goal. Our goal was, you know, we had the company, so obviously we had some interest in seeing it, you know, evolve. And uh, he said, let me see what I can do. And, you know, I'll talk to the executives, we'll come up with some ideas and we'll come back to you with it. And uh, I don't think two or three months later they called me and we met and he asked me if, you know, you want to you know, we'll do it. We'll, we'll, wow. we'll, we have a van we just built. Um, we were going to send it to Oklahoma City for their franchise, but mm -hmm. we'll send it to Santa Barbara. And uh, you can take the back third of the building and we'll put offices in there. We'll remodel it. We'll put a studio. We'll put control room. You know, we'll do all that. And I went, okay. Wow. And then I went, very cool. And he goes, and then he asked me if he, you know, do you want to run it? And that was like, it took me, you know, it took me a couple of days, kind of, because I liked what I was doing, and I also l really felt that, you know, well, this could be a real stepping stone, an opportunity, mm -hmm. especially if I could, you know, help get this thing off the ground. So, were there um, community access stations popping up all, all around California at that time, or was this kind of, mm -hmm. and did you, how did you latch on to that FCC ruling? Was that something that was just in your purview? Well, I graduated Arizona State University with a broadcast journalism degree okay. and um, worked in the PBS station all the way through school. Mm -hmm. I was totally into production, okay. big time. Makes and uh, matter of fact, we were uh, myself and another dear friend of mine were selected, you know, out of our class to produce and direct uh, KPBS or a, uh, a PBS out of an Arizona show for college called College Beat. I mean, we were. We were in really into it, and I was well. I researched cable. I, I wrote for an underground newspaper, and I wrote an article called "Coming Soon: Cerebrum Extension Cord," and I said that the ultimate goal of the American public was to be able to plug their head directly into the wall, so they wouldn't have to hassle their TV anymore. And kind of went on and on about cable TV. So I was uh, I was researching cable. I felt that there would be opportunity in my future as it was growing, and you can kind of see. Um, I wasn't interested in broadcast TV. I wasn't interested in, in being a crew person. I was more interested in, in uh, you know, produce, direct, host, write, you know, do it, doing it all. So, so here you are at this this crossroads. Really, you've got a c company right downtown. Uh, you've got an opportunity to build something brand new. And how long did it take to for you to make that decision? A couple of days. You know, I mean, I looked at the economics. I had. 
There was another gentleman in town, he's still here actually, called, uh, Gordon Forbes. He, yeah. had, he, he was interested in buying the company and getting involved with us. So it was, that was going on. Um, obviously career, you know, I've had front, uh, InnoVision for about two and a half, three years. So all those things kind of factored into it. And mm -hmm. yeah, I said, yeah. Well, plus I got a, a paycheck. There you go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so <laughs> that was kind of unique. Um, so I said, yeah, let's do it. And, uh, and this is 1975? Uh, April of 75 I started. April yeah. of 75. We did the video and everything. And it was like in the fall of 74. So things moved pretty quick after we did that. So the Nader was the real kind of Nader launch was of community coverage. And then 1975 was when it actually transitioned into public education, government, community access media. Yeah. Okay. And where, where, is, this, where is this location? We're on De La Vina, uh, Alamar and De La Vina on sure. the corner. I think you were it's telling me about that earlier. Yeah. yeah. It's the building's still there. <laughs> so that was the original. That was Santa Barbara Cable TV. And that was the name of it. Yes. Yeah, Santa Barbara Cable TV. It didn't become Cox Cable Santa Barbara until Cox started to well, I, as, we, as I talked to, uh, about the uh, SATCOM one, they launched the satellite. And we were one of the first uh, cable franchises to have an earth station, they called it, mm -hmm. and uh, up in La Cumbre Peak. So we were the first, one of the first systems to receive ESPN and uh, HBO, Showtime, Nickelodeon, WTBS, Weather Channel, all that. But we didn't have the capacity to put that on the system because it was still 12 channel. Hmm. Sandbar so when it turned to Cox Cable, is when they went to, I think, to 35 channels. So we built out, they redid the whole plant in Santa Barbara, updated the quality of the, because uh, of all this new, it, it went from a retransmission service to an entertainment you know, um, tool. Mm -hmm. So uh, that changed, that started to change Cox and everybody, that production, programming, all, it all started, the create, creative part of, of t uh, cable TV started to uh, emerge. Um, what ha one of the things, yeah, uh, so uh, until the, everybody had their own channel, um, ESPN eventually, what we did is we, for a while, we ch cherry picked off of ESPN uh, and ran different events oh, wow. and sold. Cox wanted us to sell advertising and start uh, implementing, you know, kind of some commercial aspects to what we're doing. They weren't saying do less of the community thing, mm -hmm. but if we said that if we can generate income, you know, because they were still learning themselves, then we'll get you better equipment, we'll get you more people, we'll build, we'll, we'll work with you to build this so that we have um, a commercial side as well as uh, access. So, um, yeah, it was, you know, let's go, we're in. Wow, and how many people are on your team when you walk in that first day? The first day? Yeah. Me. That's it, huh? <laughs> Yeah, I had to, I mean, you know, I had to hire somebody, you know, to play back the tapes or whatever we did at night. Um, that took a little while. And, and then there was Dr. Pope Freeman. City College was a very uh, supportive uh, institution initially. Uh, Peter Haslin did the political scientist. I think he's still out at UCSB. Yes. Uh -huh. He was very active. And, and there was a few key people that came right up, uh, the mayor, he, w he didn't waste any time getting down Who there. Who was the mayor at the time? Uh, David Schiffman. David Schiffman. And that's the picture we have in the lobby yeah. of the first Meet the Mayor show. So I've been okay. asked that a couple times. Yeah. David Schiffman. David Schiffman. And he, was, okay. he was very popular. He was pretty cool. Um, we were on the opposite ends of the politics, but uh, uh, he was re very respectful. And we were of him, and uh, we provided him Meet the Mayor. It was once a week. And then uh, we had congressmen. Congressman Lager Marcino, we had state assembly people on. Initially it was, you know, the first, the first several shows were politically uh, government, more government mm -hmm. oriented. And, it, and then people go, wait a minute, you know, and we reached out. I mean, we were, I was constantly trying to get organizations to come in and take advantage of it. And uh, we, I ended up getting my community college teaching credential. Dr. Pope Friedman helped me so we could bring in some crews and give them credit. Mm -hmm. So we credited class. We c continued the UCSB extension program, um, adult ed. So we'd teach people how to operate the cameras and equipment, you know, for a couple hours or a day. And then they would come, you know, as part of like the workshop, they would come in and 
and man the equipment. So uh, it was, you know, we were doing everything we possibly could to really legitimately create content, you know, that was for the people, by the people uh, in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. So you're running the shop by yourself and you're out there marketing, trying to get people, you've got the studio, you've got the equipment, you're supported, you've got a channel. And that's Channel 2 at the time? It was Cable 2. We called it Cable 2. Okay. When we went on the air, it was Cable 2. And beyond that, it was CBS. Okay. Or local, C it was CBS out of LA. Mm -hmm. Because, like I said earlier, the only way anybody watched anything but KEYT in Santa Barbara is you had to have cable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so 2 KY is Channel 3. NBC is uh, it was probably four. four. NBC out of four, mm -hmm. KTLA out of five. I, you know, I don't wow. you know. But you had channel two. We huh? had prime time on a 12 channel system. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> and, and so you, and you, you initially wanted to go that political route to kind of fill that gap? Yeah, I mean, politics were definitely an important part of the community. You know, to, I mean, it was electronic soapbox. You know, it's a forum. Mm -hmm. um, Gordon Forbes bought my company uh, and then uh, it teamed up, I think, with Charlie. I'm trying to remember, it was only 45 years ago. And they did Get Up, Stand Up, which was a political show, a very political show, very progressive political show. Um, Louise Phillips did Women's Spectrum. That's right. We did Black Counterpoint. Uh, we so you're bringing in guest hosts at this time, or, and you're are you guest doing shows. Guest shows. They would do their own show. Okay, they, so some of them make now what community access yeah. is about. Yeah, and people are we can't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Prime time, <laughs> like yeah. they said. You know, well, if nothing else was on, I'd watch it. Yeah. You know? So you had the Meet the Mayor show, and tell us a little bit about that Jane Fonda story, because that that's right in this probably window of time, isn't it? Oh yeah, that was right up, at, that was the beginning. Uh, well, what was happening, because there was so much government use, we felt, you know, we, we were reaching out to be the alternative, also provide an alternative to uh, what was being presented. So again, turbulent times, these people would come into Santa Barbara and do different uh, lectures or uh, they're out at the university, you know, and if we can get, a, get them to come into the studio while they're here, that was mm -hmm. fun for us and exciting. And we had, uh, uh, let's see, we had uh, Julian Bond, who is a consumer, I mean a uh, social advocate. Uh, we had um, Tom Hayden, you know, and he was pretty sure. famous from the mm -hmm. Chicago 7 and the riots and all, you know, that stuff was all pretty fresh still. Uh, and then, um, uh, Lois called me and said, hey, let's do a show. I'm g I got Jane Fonda coming. And that was at the kind of right when she was transitioning from this movie star to a, a, a you know, pretty radical spokeswoman. So that was a big get. And we were like, people started to say, wow, you know, I think more because of her celebrity than what she had to say. Mm -hmm. But what she had to say was like, it's still relevant. It, it's pretty powerful. So... Uh, you know, it was fun. We had fun. You know, that's, what like it, that's what it looked like. And, and those, the clips you, you showed uh, Saturday night at uh, the, the Pack Theater were just amazing. And I know Jane Fonda was one of the highlight clips because it was she was she, she was after it. So that then that was on the De La Vina I look lot where she yeah. walked in and yeah, come in. We had a side door with a little red light and a studio sign and wow, you know, studio and you can park. We had parking and we were like you know. Like you guys, we're legit. <laughs> we're, yeah. Get uh, there. Most people's mind. I don't know. <laughs> it's still, it's still. We weren't, you know, I mean, the equipment wasn't like network quality yet. Sure. You know, it was kind of uh, crude. But mm -hmm. it, that's it, community it, access. Yeah, but it, you know, it was it was about what we were doing, and uh, uh, yeah, everybody was very passionate, very into it, having a you know, and we had a lot of fun. I Every, we were all the same age I and. Had the same kind of you know uh, philosophy on things, and mm -hmm. uh, we were all involved in different environmental things, and uh, as well as social and uh, uh, you know what do we want? Let's what are we going to do next? You know, and there was no you know I mean, the, the general manager, the first one, Larry Herzog, was a retired colonel, I think, in the in the Marines, and he ran the place like it was the military. But he just let, he would never, he would only come back every once in a while to the back third. It was like nobody <laughs> that worked there wanted anything to, they couldn't <laughs> understand us. It was sort of like uh -huh. they were all tech, 
and engineers and and uh, uh, we were all just they thought we were you know Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters back there mm -hmm. you know when well, you looked the part <laughs> <laughs> well I was that was the times right? <laughs> <laughs> like the welcome back Cotter right right it was the time and <laughs> it was just everybody had the same haircut and yeah. you know, quite 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 fun vintage seventies huh? yeah vintage seventies so. Um, and were you were working five days a week? Was it more more than that? Was it? Uh, no, it was a it was a it was a very full time job. I mean, mm -hmm. depending on what we did, we just it wasn't about work. I mean, it was get in there and let's do some cool stuff. You know, I mean, we were getting recognition. We were having people. You know, were write about us to talk about it. You know, it, yeah. it, it, it was. Uh, you know, Santa Barbara was. You know, it's a community. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's all it was all wired together. It was all part of this new technological thing that was going on, and and. Uh, um, you know, it was, it was very well received. I mean, you know, we got a lot, I mean, we got, we have butt heads sometimes, but that sure. was fun too, yeah. you know, so. I mean, there was enough of a community, and, it, and Santa Barbara back then was pretty conservative. I mean, so it was like, we were tall poppies in this town as far as what we were doing, so. Yeah. And, and so this starts to grow 75, 76, mm -hmm. 77, mm -hmm. right? Well, and you're just you're doing the same? Or continue yeah. to build it? Just build it, better sets, better equipment, uh, mm -hmm. more people, more programming. We started to um, reach out for public service announcements and things that were more na uh, uh, on a statewide mm -hmm. as well as national, just to, to because we wanted wanted to have you know more more content, more interesting things on. We were bicycling tapes with other systems that had like minded content, mm -hmm. uh, so we were. You know, and the educational side, the university and the city college started to do some things. And, and uh, yeah, we just, you know, gates open. And then, uh, and then Cox said, look, you know, sell advertising. We want to start selling advertising. And this was in anticipation of the satellite and everything else that was coming. They, they kind of, they used this sort of as, um, you know, kind of a uh, research and development too. Because they had franchises, I don't remember how many, but all over the country. And there wasn't a lot of us that were d doing it as aggressively as, as Santa Barbara. So we would get a lot of uh, press within the uh, cable industry for the things that we were doing, which made you know, the folks at, in Atlanta happy. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, Cox is, like I said all along, I mean, they've, oh, they've been, they were extremely supportive with uh, providing us you know, uh, the access without you know, any, any rules and regulations. I mean, and at the time in New York and other places, things were getting pretty risque on cable. <laughs> you know, the big, they were, the big topics were like some, some guy was, you know, <laughs> fell asleep or something and the program ended up running pro, you know, porno uh, in, in full, in, when it was at Palm Springs, you okay. know, that, that, we made it very clear that that wouldn't be in the studio. <laughs> so, so um, and you were allowed with the cable franchise agreements permitted uh, advertising at the time. And then the second question is, did you start taping government meetings at all? N we, it, everything was in the studio. We hadn't moved yeah. out to, um, that was towards my, the end of my tenure that we started, that Cox started to, you know, wire up uh, the government and things like that. Um, and spend, you know, money to, to uh, provide uh, individual channels because we didn't have the capacity in the beginning. It was an evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. But and then, but you did get it out in the community. Uh, one of the highlight stories uh, for me <laughs> it was the uh, <laughs> the Fiesta coverage, right? Um, that you parodied. Um, where did you first find the comedians? Because that's a logical fit for community access. I, I well, we've been doing parades. We rolled that van anytime we can get out of, out of the I office, bet, too. I bet. <laughs> so we did Fiesta for years. Uh, we did. Uh, was KYT doing it, too? No. Nobody was rolled. No one had van. No one, no one yet. Um, like I said, it was more film. Uh, and the news was shot in 16 millimeter and cut and, you know, those type of things. Whereby video was more on a, a cable at the time. But uh, we did, you know, the Freedom Train came in here uh, from Bicentennial. Uh, we did IVA volleyball. We were totally into, you know, surf stuff. Um, and then uh, Proctor and Ward were two comedians on K-Tide. Mm -hmm. And K-Tide was kind of the alternative radio station at the time. And uh, they did a, a daily 
news. They satirized the news. And mind <laughs> you, this is like in the mid 70s. So uh, I think right around, I mean, maybe Saturday Night Live was just starting. But this, th this was, they were hysterical. They would do the, what they called the nude news. They would, they would claim they were naked doing the news <laughs> and just rip the, everybody apart. And they were pretty funny, and they had a big following, both uh, as uh, listeners as well as advertisers. They were big. They were they were kind of on Loman and Barkley, you know, like in L.A. So uh, um, I went, hey, uh, let's let. We were looking at running movies, uh, just mm -hmm. one night a week. Mm -hmm. And we could afford to, to license, you know, these old black and white campy uh, films from the 50s, which, you know, pretty funny. So we came up with this idea. I reached out to Proctor, who is a crazy, brilliant writer, com uh, comedy writer, um, about doing something. So we came up with this idea of, uh, back then on, on some of the stations that did run movies, Somebody would host the movie. There was Ben Hunter. He was pretty well known. And he would do like a little couple of minutes before the movie about what you're about to see and then run a clip of the movie and then before commercial would tell you what you saw. Mm -hmm. And then they'd go to commercial and then he'd tell you what you're about to see. And then they'd run another clip and they'd do that. So we thought, hey, let's, let's do that. Let's do it with an, you know, some attitude. And we came up with this station called Channel 88. And the reason we picked 88 was the TV bandwidth at the, you know, the broadcast bandwidth ends at 84. And because our picture quality wasn't really super sharp, so that we were channel 88, we were like on the other side of the end of the bandwidth. And then we had um, uh, color in the poster contest with these guys, and we came up with uh, Procter & Ward host the worst movie of the week. Mm -hmm. And they would do these campy uh, studio stuff about the movie, and then we'd run a clip of the movie. So uh, one of them was, High School Confidential, which was made in the 50s. It was about pot smoking in high school. And they had a, there was a narc. And, and it was with Russ Tamlin, Mamie Van Doren, Jerry Lee Lewis was in it, uh, Michael Landon. It was a funny movie, watching it in the 70s, right? And uh, so Proctor and Ward, as a community service, um, took drugs on the show so that the parents watching would have a better understanding of the effects. Was and this legit? Did they actually take No. Okay. They took these big, you know, it was like a big candy, you know, and they, it was all uh, over the place. And we just, you know, would make it all psychedelic and, you know, have crazy music. And Proctor would go, you know, they would do the whole, you know, stereotype drug thing. And they go, oh, man, I feel like take, we need to take a commercial break. Yeah, let's go get a 25-pound Hershey bar. Yeah, what a great <laughs> idea, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the whole thing together was, uh, you know, extremely popular because you could tell because we gave all our advertisers that we got would have the posters. And then, they, you know, we had prizes for, you know, gift certificates and things for the best colored in poster. So that was a way to kind of mark, you know, find out what our Nielsen rating was. Yeah. And um, we did some fun commercials. There was, uh, uh, we won some Santa Barbara advertising awards for a couple of them. One is I remember it was Proctor, it was for uh, Montecito Wine and Spirits, I think, was a very high-end wine shop that was big supporter of Proctor and Ward on radio and TV. And we had a scene where Proctor and Ward were, you know, dressed up just as bums, just passed out in the alleyway. And some kid skateboards by and they wake up and they start drinking out of a bound, passing a brown paper bag back and forth. And, and Proctor pulls out this, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon from whatever as the wine of the week for the Montecito wine, you know, just sticky, off, huh. offbeat, irreverent, and goofy, you know. And, and th was this on Channel 2 as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. ran in prime time, 8 to 11, you know, every, uh, every th I don't remember what, I think it was Thursday night, worst movie of the week. So it was, you know, we were raising money, we were, everything was, we were having so much fun. I mean, the, some of the shtick we came up with was, uh, you could hear us laughing in the background because they would just <laughs> improvise, you know. It was no whole, it, it, as I said, the, the kids took over the candy store. I mean, community stuff, yeah, we were kind of getting bored with the mayor and all that. We wanted, yes, yes. you know, we had our own aspirations. And, uh, and, and uh, so what happened was, is uh, that led to the Fiesta Parade. Mm -hmm. KCOY had a truck, right? Mm -hmm. They leased a truck or whatever, and they, 1977, 
they beat us because they were all upset that we were taking advertising revenue out of their pockets and they made a big deal out of it. And they were, as a matter of fact, they questioned if we could. Mm -hmm. You know, that started to fall into it because wait, we're on the system and we're mandated to be on cable and you guys are selling advertising. And it's like, you yeah, know, it's still free speech. I mean, it's still, you know, we can do it, whatever. So uh, uh, they were all, they pumped the heck out of this thing that they were doing the parade. Fine. So we came up with this idea of having Procter and Ward host the parade. <laughs> Say, hey, so uh, boom, it sold out like, as soon as we announced, the, we did the uh, black and white artwork, right? Full page mm -hmm. ad in the paper, in the news press, uh, like on a Saturday, you know, in entertainment you know, section, and color in the poster contest. And then, um, uh, and it's kind of a character of them riding a Brahma bull or whatever with the parade behind him, and it's, we, it's, and we played off the worst movie of the week. We called it the worst parade coverage ever created. So that was our goal, is to make the worst parade coverage ever created. And um, so we're, we're down there on State Street, uh, set up, and uh, they're, they're, we had the sp you know, Spanish music and the La Fiesta, Welcome, uh, Santa Barbara, you know, beautiful Santa Barbara, perfect weather, summer. And uh, they start describing traffic going up and down State Street. Oh, there's a 1966 you know, Volkswagen. Oh, uh, wave. And um, they realize they're on the wrong street. So that's how the thing opened up. They were just <laughs> two blocks. Someone told them, hey, the parade's two blocks over. <laughs> so we go to commercial break. We come back. You know, we're in the middle of Fiesta. Mm -hmm. And off we went. You know, we're down here on State Street watching all these white people dressed up as Mexicans. And <laughs> that went on for an hour and a half. Um, yeah. There's Padre Sierra teaching the Indians how to use charge cards, you know, on and on and on. There's some really great, hilarious video of, of, of their shtick on this. Um, you'd mentioned there's three things that you, you, you don't mess around with in Santa Barbara. <laughs> well, what happened was is that we ran the parade coverage 8 o'clock. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Because the parade was on Thursday in those days. Yeah, yeah, that night, Friday night, Saturday night, while the town was full of tourists and uh, on a 12-channel system. So if you were in your hotel room and you, you turned the dial, you, wa you, you, you watched. We, we did everything we could to over, overcome KCOY and kind of, uh, you know, try to beat them to the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, that following week, there was standing room only at, City Hall. People were really, really pissed and uh, so bad that they, we were in for a rate increase and all this stuff with the city and they want me fired and they want to shut this, this TV thing down we're doing and it was pretty intense and hit the paper and uh, ironically um, uh, most of the council people were out of town. They just bolt during Fiesta. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so none of them saw it. And they asked us if we would show it to them so we could find out what the controversy was all about before they could even talk about it. And uh, so we invited them over to Santa Barbara Cable TV in our studio. But on the, uh, my boss, Curtis Speck at this time, he was pretty like, you know, what did you do here? You know, it's kind of messing things up for us. And, I remember him saying, you got your ass into this, you better get it out. And I wanted to keep my job, and so we had to figure out how to, how to get around it. So I invited everybody I knew uh, to come to uh, watch the screening, just so that my friends would be there with me and laugh. Yes. And uh, yeah, we showed it to them, and I figured they would last about 15, 20 minutes and mm -hmm. get bored with it, and they did. In about 15 minutes, they all left. But the press was there. Every, there was so much media. It was wow. like uh, L.A. Every, uh, it, was, uh, it was amazing how much media coverage this thing got um, locally. And, um, and uh, what happened was the following morning, uh, I get a phone call from my dad who lives in L.A. And it's like, what are you doing in Santa Barbara? And I'm going, what, you know, I'm like, what? He goes, what's this parade thing? I go, how'd you hear about that? <laughs> and he goes, I would get a copy of the LA Times. You're on the third page. Wow. And, 
And I went and got a copy, and I went, oh, man. <laughs> he just opened the paper up, and the whole third page uh, fold is the story about what you mentioned. There's three things you don't laugh at in Santa Barbara. Mom, apple pie, and the Fiesta Parade. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a story, well-written, funny, uh -huh. about the controversy. And uh, uh, so then Proctor, that ended up creating uh, uh, a lot of, what, more interest. And these letters to the editor, I mean, they were getting... Oh, I could imagine. I had, remember back in the day where you, you give, your secretary would give you a pink slip, uh, who called, their phone number, you know. Mm. And I mean, they were coming in like, it was like I couldn't even deal with it. It was such a, people would, hated us, they loved us, and then uh, the, the Santa Barbara News Press, to their credit, wrote an editorial called The Freedom of Bad Taste. And, uh, and then that, that ignited a free speech thing. Mm -hmm. And that, everybody that just stood up and go, hey, we don't have to agree with it. It could be stupid, it could be corny, it could be off the wall. We liked it as a lampoon. Uh, but they have the right to do it. And that, that wave was bigger than the negative. Mm -hmm. And then we started getting national publicity. Uh, TV Guide did a piece on it and then uh, uh, we just kept it up. Procter and Ward, we just kept doing our shows and we kept doing our lampooning and uh, they did their, uh, Procter and Ward did the history of Santa Barbara, their own version of it, and uh, we donated a bunch of money to RSVP, uh, the Retired Senior Citizen Volunteer, Volunteer Program. We got all these seniors to help us and they, we made them into the native daughters of the Golden Arches and they chased Procter and Ward from historical site to historical site, and that was kind of part of the story. So we just kept it up, and then uh, the National Cable Television Association, just like your awards that you had the other night, uh, give out national awards every year mm -hmm. and at the convention in Las Vegas. And we got the highest award in cable for entertainment, uh, for basic cable, and uh, they were very complimentary, and we got more press and uh, had an opportunity to you know, tell people about, you know, you get that public access and community access can have a sense of humor, mm -hmm. you know, and that, I think, uh, that, you know, our, everybody, Procter & Ward, my career, uh, Cable 2, Cox Cable, everything just, it elevated the awareness that uh, people were watching this. Yeah, yeah now that was one of my, my takeaways, is you can have a, uh, a great sense of humor, and um, we look forward to doing that more, because that, that was really entertaining. So you've taken it now through the 70s, and you were um, getting ready to move on to other things. Well, the opportunity, uh, you know, we started to, to develop in cable. My aspiration, my uh, um, goals in, uh, were to um, get into sports mm -hmm. television. That, I mean, that, I was producing uh, UCSB volleyball for ESPN. I was freelancing for ESPN at the time. I got UCSB I, uh, on there because they played Pepperdine, U uh, UCLA, USC, you know, all the big volleyball uh, guys were playing at that time. Yeah. Sinjin Smith, Karch Karai. So um, we were covering volleyball for ESPN. I was doing that independently when ESPN, because they wanted to be on Santa Barbara's cable franchise, but they were running Big Eight, um, you know, basketball and ping pong and darts and I mean at the beginning they had nothing really and they wanted to come to Santa Barbara and, and basically I told them you know we want volleyball surfing skateboard sure. you know we want mm -hmm. what's a, what appeals to this market you know and they said well if you if you produce it we'll we'll run it you know we're at that stage of their development and my boss said you can do what you want on the weekends and as long as you run it on you know our state on your station you can sell advertising so we negotiated all that and we actually were producing for ESPN before ESPN was on our system, but airing ESPN programming that we were doing. Wow. We did beach volleyball. We introduced uh, beach volleyball to them, uh, surfing, mm -hmm. um, you know, things that were really, uh, you know, interesting to our market. And that, you know, then I started to, my, my goals were to, to produce national and international sports, you mm -hmm. know, especially, they used to call it trash sports back then. They didn't call it extreme sports. The suits back in uh, in uh, Connecticut that ran ESPN called us trash producers. There was pro sports, and then there were trash sports, and we had to call it action sports, 
We called it that. They didn't call it that. So we were trash producers in the beginning. And, and then, of course, once they started to make money, then it was extreme sports. Yes. And the X Games and all Look that. Look at it that. now. Oh, yeah. it's crazy. I know. I've tried to bring a little bit of that flavor back into the studios with some pictures and of the action sports. Were you doing it out of the van still? Uh, we were bringing in big trucks out of L.A. and, oh, yeah. and, San, and San Diego. Um, yeah, no, when we were doing national stuff, it was a different ballgame, so to speak. It was, we had to bring in, you know, real crews, and uh, uh, we were doing, we were, you know, it's network quality, network work. But some of my better employees at Cox would work on it as well. I mean, it was a great mm -hmm. learning curve for them and also opportunity to get national credits. And when, you know, they start moving in that direction, and then, um, and then the whole country, you know, once this, everybody built out their cable systems, everybody had ESPN, and in the beginning USA Cable ran sports, um, you know, that opened up a lot of opportunity. So uh, I was offered a job in, in um, San Diego to launch what was called Box Seat out of Carlsbad. Um, so I moved down there to work on that. Uh, and then... Uh, it was the first regional sport network uh, concept was Bill Daniels, who was a big cable mogul, wanted to do regional sports, and he wanted to do Southern California, and he ran his corporation out of Del Mar, so they wanted to do something down there. So they launched Box Seat. I did pro beach volleyball. I did a couple of events for them. Hmm. We did the world championship, I think, in 82. And then Jerry Buss showed up one day, and uh, to make a long story short, bought it and moved it to Inglewood and called a prime ticket. Sure. And they moved. But I was, I fell in love with Solana Beach. And I, uh, you know, I surfed and uh, you could live on the beach a lot less expensive than here in, San Diego, in Santa Barbara. So I, I stayed and started uh, frontline video and film. So, and then started producing for. And before you left, you wanted to make sure that uh, cable access was uh, sturdy here and uh, in place for, for a long time and you were able to accomplish that with a 15-year agreement? What happened was is uh, I knew I was going to leave um, and we had about the comp we knew it'd take about five to six months for them to get the studio built and everything down in San Diego so I, I kept my mouth shut but I, I was like out of here um, but I didn't want to leave we were right in the middle of the refranchising with the city of San, Santa Barbara and locking all that. So my, I devoted most of my time to figuring out how uh, in the refranchise, the language, what I had to do at City Hall, et cetera, et cetera to make sure that uh, public government educational access will have its own channels in the new, once the new system was built, funding, mm -hmm. um, and it was a 15 year refranchise. So uh, it, it was, you know, just it was the last thing I did here before I left was to work with the general manager, uh, s the people in San Diego and Atlanta to get their support and then uh, write it into the language of the franchise so that it was locked in. And, and uh, yeah, so we finished, uh, you know, kind of wiped my hands of all that and said, it's all yours, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm going to go seek my fame and fortune. Yeah, well, <laughs> thank you. I mean, that's, I mean, and we're here 45 years later. <laughs> it's just... I'm so stoked. I mean, how things, uh, you know, especially in this world, they don't last 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It was, uh, yeah. Well, we, so we thank you. Uh, and what a, what a journey uh, this has been in, in this community. It's, um, I think we were able to showcase, you know, how, how important it is to give voice to citizens and, and, and people to tell extraordinary stories that may not be, a, be available with a commercial. Right. You don't have to appeal to everybody. You just have to appeal to somebody, mm -hmm. you know? and, and I think it empowers these people. And, and, uh, and I think what you're doing is carrying it on and, and reinforcing it and, and giving them recognition. And uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. It's very cool. I remember that day you walked into, into, into here, and I don't know what you were doing uh, in town, but you'd walked into the, to the studios. Um, and Ira goes, who is anybody upstairs? So my office is upstairs, and I come down. He goes, you know, I uh, was one of the pioneers of early access television in Santa Barbara. And I'm like, really? That is fascinating. Because I had only pieced it back to er, you know, the mid-90s. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I don't think people really knew that it's been a part of the community since 
you know, early, early 1970s. So we ended up talking probably for at least an hour, I would think, just standing on just fascinating stories. Um, and so when we had a chance to do this uh, awards gala, I reached out and said, would you, would you be a part of it? Because uh, we, you know, the origin story is so important and it's great that people love the history and you agreed immediately. We got a date on the calendar and then you worked and you brought in some incredible clips. Um, those old photos are amazing. In fact, somebody wrote us on Facebook the other day and says, you know, that person in that Fiesta Parade near Woolworths, that's my mom. I've never seen a photo of her. Mm. Uh, really? Yes. And just this weekend, so would you happen to have the er that original? Because she's passed now, and I know that's her. Wow. So Very it, cool. Yeah, very <laughs> cool. Those old, old photos went uh, trending. And so we did a little retrospective last night, uh, or Saturday night, and it was, uh, it was a hit. Uh, it was a real, real hit. And so thank you very much for for being there that night, for coming by the studios, for all you did to set up the foundation where we are today. And um, this conversation went quick. You see, we're under two minutes left in the show. Yeah, I told you it'd go quick. Wow. <laughs> I guess I talked too much. No, that is great. <laughs> do, you have, do you have any last uh, parting shots on community access television? <sighs> There is life after community access, I'll tell you that. And it's your job to keep it going. And, and um, I think, you know, hopefully f from our mutual experience that uh, get some attitude. Yeah. And, and give it some humor. And, I, you yeah. know, don't worry about what people, some of the people say, just as long as somebody is there and enjoys it. So your, your, your goal is to just reach a, a small part of the community, you know, well. That's right. And we are reaching out with the nonprofit sectors, with covering events, uh, getting more and more. I think we're at that phase of where you were in that, getting it in studio and now pushing out in the community. So it looked like you had a, had a lot of fun doing it. And uh, hopefully I can follow in those footsteps and, and really push us out in the community and cover some of those things that aren't gonna be covered, you, you know, with, by the big uh, traditional things, the parades and, and some of the side conversations. So. Uh, is that the clock I hear? So I, I think <laughs> we done. The music is playing. <laughs> we are done, uh, and you hope you had a nice uh, weekend in, in Santa Barbara and and drive safe. Let's definitely keep in touch. Yes, uh, of course. And next time I'm in Solana Beach, I'll I'll, we'll go for I'll, I'll let you know. I'll show you around. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so thanks again. Uh, Thank you. You've been watching uh, the Santa Barbara Forum, uh, produced by uh, Michael Nicholson. Uh, Elliot's in the studio helping out. So thank you. Um, Find out more at tvsp.tv. We stream on demand um, and we're on Roku and all our channels. We'll have this up on Facebook as well as the complete video from the award ceremony on Saturday. Thanks again for watching. Good day.